Okay, um, hello and welcome to the Cinema of the DFF. This is the last evening in the framework of um, the recent, most recent lecture and film series dedicated to Vera Hitilova. Um, I'll take this opportunity to yeah, say a big thank you to all of our partners, especially Daniel Fairfax and Vincent Sediger and the Institute für Theater, Film and Medienwissenschaft. Um, also our other partners, the Hessische Film and Medien Academy and the Cluster Contrast. And um, also a big thank you to the Narodny Filmowy Archiv in Prague, who have provided us with um, great prints of many of Vera Hitilova's films. And I'm really happy that tonight Eva Maziaska is here in person and will deliver her speech um, in the cinema and not only on Zoom. So I'll quickly hand over to Daniel to introduce her and um, yeah, uh, insightful evening. Thanks. Uh, yes, uh, thanks once again also to Bjorn uh, for being the kind of organizational arm of this series uh, from uh, the DFF. Um, we're uh, very happy that we were able to shine a spotlight on Vera Hitelova's work um, through the course of these last um, I mean, the, the whole year's program, uh, and it'll be very exciting to finish on this film, uh, Traps, Passi, Passi, Passiti, uh, with uh, an insightful uh, introduction uh, by Eva Mazieska. Uh Eva is, I think, one of the foremost scholars of Eastern European cinema. She is originally from Poland um, and focuses a lot on Polish cinema, but is also interested in the other cinemas of Eastern Europe, including... Uh, Czechoslovak cinema. Uh, she uh, initially studied in uh, Poland, first in Warsaw, and then in uh, Łódź University, if I can well, pronounce I just it. Had the PhD in the P yeah, she completed a PhD at, at Łódź University uh, before moving to Britain uh, to take up a te teaching post at the University of Central Lancaster in Preston, uh, in uh, the north uh, east uh, northwest of the country. Um, where she uh, initially uh, started in 1997 and then became a professor in 2008. Um, <clears throat> as I mentioned, she's not only interested in Polish cinema, but uh, Eastern European cinema more broadly, and and also has a range of interests, including not just cinema, but also various forms of popular media, media and music. Um, and uh, she's also the editor of Studies in Eastern European Cinema, really a kind of authoritative uh, scholarly journal uh, on this particular field. Uh, she's also a machine when it comes to publishing, uh, having um, put out something like around 20 uh, book length works, monographs and edited collections. Uh, I wanted to give you a taste for only some of the titles uh, to give a, a sense for the breadth of her work. These are her most recent books, uh, Popular Polish Electronic Music 1970 to 2020, uh, published last year by Routledge. Polish Popular Music on Screen by Palgrave, uh, 2020. Popular Viennese Electronic Music from 2019. Popular Music in the Post-Digital Age, Politics, Economy, Culture and Technology, also 2019. Uh, then like earlier works include more cinema-oriented uh, books, including Contemporary Cinema and Neoliberal Ideology, an edited collection from 2018. From Self-Fulfillment to Survival of the Fittest, Work in European Cinema from the 1960s to the Present from 2015, and Marks at the Movies, Revisiting History, Theory and Practice, also an editor collection from 2014. Uh, so that gives you a sense for the kind of wide breadth of uh, Eva Maciejewska's scholarly interests. But right now she will be uh, talking to us about Traps by Vera Chitlova. So please welcome to the stage uh, Eva Maciejewska. And there will be a, sorry, just one last one. As, as usual, we will uh, hear from Eva and then uh, break for approximately 10 minutes and then uh, run the film. And then uh, you're all welcome to join us afterwards for a Q&A uh, on what promises to be a very interesting, uh, hopefully, discussion uh, about a very interesting film. So thank you now to Eva Mazioska. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel, for inviting me and introducing me so nicely. And thank you for coming. And it's really a great pleasure to talk about Hitilova. I mentioned to Daniel that I was interested in her work and actually tried to do a book with a colleague from uh, Czechoslovakia many years ago. And somehow we, we failed to find the publisher. And uh, later, we managed to uh, do a double issue of studies in Eastern European cinema devoted to her work. So. Uh, this sort of in interest uh, persisted, and I cannot say that I'm a, you know, typical Hitilova 
uh, scholar. Uh, that said, it was a great pleasure for me to um, revisit this film, one of uh, Hitler's, Hitler's uh, less known films. Uh, and for this reason, I think, uh, you know, in a sense, um, uh, almost start from scratch because so little was uh, devoted to it uh, previously. So what I want to say, I would like to talk a bit about the place of traps in the context of Hitler's work and then about this uh, film's content and ideology. Uh, I try not to um, spoil the pleasure of watching by revealing too much about it. Uh, this is always a danger when you introduce, uh, introduce a film, but I think maybe the pleasure of watching this film is not so much about finding out how it finishes, but you know other aspects of the film. Then I will talk a bit about the film's style uh, in terms of acting, camera work, design and music. And then I will talk about uh, Trapp's other cre creators, as obviously films are not only works of um, directors, but also actors and cinematographers and so on. Um, so this is how Hitilova looked. Perhaps, you know, those who uh, attended these sessions uh, are used to her um, image. This was at the time of her, um, you know, in her prime, so to speak. Um, Again, maybe you are already sick about uh, listening about uh, uh, Czech New Wave, but maybe it's worth mentioning uh, for those who are not that familiar with uh, this phenomenon and Hitilova's place in it, that uh, her greatest successes are linked to this period, which uh, lasted roughly from 63 to 68. Uh, and Czech New Wave was a group of filmmakers who co-scripted and played in each other films. So it was very much a, a joint uh, effort. And these are the main representatives, uh, Menzel, Foreman, Hitilova, Passel, Shorm. Um, there were some women, uh, other women on, 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 on the fringe, uh, like uh, Esther Klumbachova, but nevertheless, uh, 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 Hitilova was the only uh, prominent uh, female uh, filmmaker in this group, which uh, on on the one hand make her um, a kind of um, uh, make it more difficult for her to somehow break through and um, became a famous filmmaker, but on the other hand uh, rendered her unique. So uh, the uh, People who write about Hitilova ask the question how she managed and how her work was different from that of her colleagues. And for sure, it was brief, different. Um, so the Czechoslovak New Wave is mainly remembered for its fly on the wall, realism and warm humor. But in reality, its uh, main representatives, um, and there were also other um, who belong to this movement, have uh, very diverse styles ranging from documentary realism, such as Foreman, through psychological realism, um, represented by Menzel and Passer, leaning towards a better form like Schaum, and finally surrealist, grotesquerie, and Dadaism, Hitilova and also uh, Herz. So Hitilova, from this perspective, is, uh, we can say, on, um, on an extreme end of um, uh, of new wave being the one who is uh, who was um, uh, least uh, involved in um, re realism. Um, uh, in these films, contemporary topics prevailed, but the two new wave uh, Czech films, uh, Czech Czechoslovak films, which were awarded with Oscars, were film about the Second World War. So again, in terms of. Uh, 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 themes they were rather um, versatile, and I think this uh, this uh, actually um, is also reflected in the later work of these filmmakers. Because when the when the movement finished, the films which they were making uh, became um, very diverse. So they actually had less and less in common as the time uh, passed, and even each of the director made, made films uh, with a, a different style. And this will be also true about Hitilova, and perhaps you heard about her later work, some um, 
kind of very realistic. Some docu she made some documentaries, some very much in the spirit of this sort of uh, grotesquerie, uh, which is known from her best known uh, film, Daisies. The year 1968 marked the peak of the movement and its end. Following it, some directors such as Foreman and Passer emigrated. The careers of others, including Hitilova, suffered. The, uh, these directors had problems with um, uh, you know, securing, maybe not so much funding as, as, as sort of getting permission to make films. So um, they... Um, Often makes makes made films in uh, in uh, um, long um, in intervals, and the sense of belonging to a movement had gone too. Hitilova managed to continue making films, but they failed to reach the popularity of her main film from the new wave period, Daisies. For I would say, <coughs> Western scholars. She's uh, largely known as a director of, um, of this film. So I'm very glad and grateful to Daniel that he actually um, allows us to, um, you know, appreciate uh, Hitilova's uh, in more um, dimensions. Um, now, in, in terms of uh, uh, the place uh, of traps uh, in uh, her work, uh, it's uh, one of two um, um, fiction films, uh, full-length fi fiction films, she made in the 90s. So not a huge, really, output at the time. Nevertheless, she continued a uh, working film. The other is The, Inher the Inheritance of Fuck of Guy's Good Day. Uh, you could even see that the title is sort of speaks for um, itself somehow uh, the the title expresses her I think dissatisfaction with what happened uh, with uh, Czechoslovakia after um, the fall of uh, communism or communism um, so this this film is going to be uh, described as belonging to a uh, post-communist period in Hitilova's uh, career and their connection be connections between these two films. But I must say, I haven't seen um, The Inheritance afresh, so hopefully you wouldn't ask me about uh, these connections as I'm not very well prepared to, to, to answer it. I watched it many years previously. Um, so these films, as I said, uh, can be described as her post-communist films, not only due to being made after the fall of the Iron Curtain, but also taking issue with what can be described as the post-communist condition. And I will mention that in due course. And these films are, as I already mentioned, less acclaimed than Hitilova's new wave productions, also less acclaimed than some of her kind of later films, like from, from the 70s largely on the account of being sort of more crude in dealing with her subject matter and lacking the stylistic innovations of her earlier work. So in this later film, films, there is a sense that she somehow, you know, repeats herself um, and uh, she gets kind of also more angry. So this, these are the, the, the two, two aspects, I would say, we can uh, sense more anger in these two films than in her previous uh, productions. And another aspect of these films is that much in them is conveyed through dialogue, which we can say is against the spirit of the new wave, uh, which tended to apply visual means to convey complex topics. Moreover, characters lack complexity and whimsicality of her earlier films. I hope it doesn't work to kind of negative, to, to, to judgmental, you know, not every film has to be, you know, visual. You know, I love myself films by Eric Romer, where, is the, where, where there is a lot of, you know, talking. So I, this, this is just the case that there's quite a lot of, you know, dialogue in these films. And, uh, and the characters, I would say, are simpler. What we find in these films is criticism of capitalism. Um, and I would say this is, this is not, not a bad thing <laughs> per se, 
uh, but uh, what we learn in these films is somehow, um, you know, Hitilovas uh, claim that capitalism is bad. They are very damning about uh, the system which, um, you know, replaced uh, states socialism in, um, in Czechoslovakia. In Czechoslovakia, probably worse than communism, and this should be seen also in the context that you know Hitilova was never a propagandist, you know, director. She never praised state socialism, so you could see how really she is negative about capitalism in this context. Um, why, why is it like that? I would say the reason is that it combines social injustice and corruption with aesthetic health. There is the uh, kind of um, emphasis that, you know, the, the world got uglier since communist collapsed. Um, maybe it's also worth mentioning that during this decade, Hitelova was also very vocal about um, changing in the... Um, in the film industry in Czechoslovakia, there was a lot of issues around uh, privatizing Barandov studio and you know um, shrinking of film industry. This wasn't really um, confined to uh, Czechoslovakia or later Czechia. You know, across the Eastern Bloc, we had the same problems that you know fewer films were made, that the studios were you know, privatized, some studios collapsed and were sold off and so on and so forth. The situation um, normally um, improved um, after 2000 and, and Hitilova was perhaps the most kind of vocal uh, critic of this, um, uh, of this change. And uh, actually she said that from this perspective, communism was much better because there was much more, you know, respect for film as art. Um, and we can say that this uh, view is reflected in this film. So consequently, her post-communist films give a sense of angry outbursts of somebody left behind by the sweep of history, which is how Hitilova felt uh, in the 90s about, about herself. I would say... Um, this is not again confined to Hitilova. In many countries, filmmakers who were very prominent were complaining about this shift. Um, so her criticism of capitalism is nearly explicit. This can be uh, explained simply by her negative attitude to that, but also somehow more we can say positively, this reflects the fact that uh, censorship eased. So while in films made in the 60s, it was really difficult to uh, um, criticize the system openly. On this occasion, you know, basically nobody cares. She could say what she wanted to say and she used it for better or for, for worse. Many, many critics in the 90s complained that, you know, this kind of elaborate metaphorical kind of language um, died. Uh, because you could say everything, you know, and, and if you can say everything, then it, um, you know, doesn't somehow develop your ability to communicate. So this easing of censorship is seen as a factor in the overall lowering of the standards of the new wave directors. For example, Menzel is also criticized for, um, you know, losing his talent. And generally, many filmmakers from Eastern Europe uh, who started their careers during the period of state socialism went through the same kind of um, uh, change. For example, Andrzej Wajda, the leading Polish di director, he just simply admitted that the fall of the Berlin Wall made him lost and confused. He says, I lost my talent. I cannot really communicate with the, with the audience. Um, Hitilova didn't say that, but you know, we, we can say there is the same sub somehow difficulty to, you know, to um, capture the reality. So the, the sort of the negative aspect is there, but you know, one can ask, and so what? You know, what do you propose? And I would say this is this is lacking in these films. There's a lot of outrage. There is a lot of criticism, but but somehow um, without, um, uh, you know offering any kind of solution. 
that maybe we can say this is also in the spirit of uh, Hetty Leva, who was always kind of, you know, um, iconoclast who criticized rather than being, you know, constructive critic. Now, looks, let's look at the characters in the film. <coughs> The films, the, 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 the characters are kind of neatly divided into men and women, not only because uh, they have uh, different sex, but also they occupy different social positions as uh, Hitilova sees it. So, okay. So, um, men are in position of political and economic power. One of the characters is a deputy minister, another is a millionaire or perhaps a billionaire businessman, and they use their power to take advantage of women. And the, uh, sorry that I will now spoil it, but there is no way not to spoil the, um, uh, the content. The extreme case of the situation is when two men rape a female vet, Lenka, just for fun, and they pretend that nothing happened. Um, this allows Lenka to get the, her revenge on the brutish men. Lenka, unlike the men, is presented as honest and straight, or at least this is what the director intended to do. In my opinion, she didn't really succeed in this case. I will talk about it a bit la later. So Hitilova's films were never renowned for their psychological subtlety. On the contrary, her characters were purposefully lacking depth. This is especially the case with the two Marias in Daisies who behave like mechanical dolls. A similar situation we find in Traps. <coughs> but I would say in this respect, the films are kind of different because uh, we get the sense that they, de they, the, the lack of depth reflects their true character. It's not the issue of representation, it's the issue of reality. These people are like that in reality. All her male characters are primitive creatures without any sense of empathy or self-awareness. They only care about their pleasure and status and use women as servants and unpaid prostitutes. They don't want to commit to them because this would limit their freedom. So basically, men are bad, bad in this in this film. Capitalism is bad, and men are bad. And she links very much capitalism with masculinity. At the same time, ma men are presented as lacking purpose and direction, except from a desire to get more money. This might reflect the way Hitilova sees capitalism as ultimately pointless. And this is what she also wrote when she criticized the film industry at the time. Donald, one of the characters, is literally impotent when he has sex with his wife. Another character is literally not an impotent, but he has unable to form a lasting relationship with women. He also fails to commit suicide, so everything he touches seems to change into that. So there is also this sense of men kind of not being able to achieve what they want to achieve. And rape is sort of proposed here as a cure to impotence. Um, so basically there are no healthy sexual relations presented in the film. Perhaps again reflecting the problem of capitalism as Hitilova sees it. Uh, when capitalism fails something, uh, to achieve something by peaceful means, it gets violent, we seem to get the message. And also men uh, are full of self-pity. Um, okay, maybe I just put it so you wouldn't see more about the film. And they are also childish. Uh, they kind of compete who had uh, more bad luck and so on. Um, they call Le Lenka a bitch uh, and they are, as I said, they lack sort of self-awareness. I would s say that um, this uh, representation suggests that um, uh, Hitilova moved from the position of a feminist. She was, she's often um, associated with uh, feminist cinema, though she doesn't really um, uh, self um, 
identify herself as a feminist whenever she was asked whether she's a feminist she claimed that she's just individualist which in my view very much reflects this sort of coming from eastern europe where people didn't want to kind of be seen as part of the group but you know in criticism particularly western criticism she is seen as a feminist but i would say here she actually is not so much a feminist she doesn't fight really for you know um women having equal position with men he, here she actually expresses her hatred of men so they are basically no good men in this film, never even the sort of good left-wing environment conscious man, Lenka's boyfriend Michal, tends to be bad. So everybody's bad. They are all bad. They are also all fake. So um, uh, as I said, no redeeming features on the side of men. This constitutes a difference in comparison with her earlier films when men were often foolish, but not so primitive and vicious at the same time. And we can find some of these films when somehow men were portrayed in, in better light. Why this shift? We don't know for sure. I don't know. Uh, but, uh, you know, my hypothesis is that it can be seen as an elaboration and intensification of motives present in Hitler's earlier film. So, so somehow from not being too sympathetic towards men, she moved to the position of really sort of hating them. It can be also regarded as a reflection of a wider culture and cinema at the time. It's worth mentioning that the same decade when traps were made, Ridley Scott directed Telman and Louise, in which two women escape from rape and men who cause them disappointment. So it's a bit like Telma and Louise in the sense that, you know, there are no good men there, except that in Telma and Louise we have two friends here, we have a kind of s single character. So we can, you can see here the... The, the character with uh, with the knife, which expresses her, you know, hatred of men, which I will argue reflects uh, Hitler's own position. As for women, women are aware of men's short shortcomings. Uh, we um, we we have we hear he hear women often complaining about men but stay with them because of the lack of better options. So at the same time as sort of, you know, um, uh, condemning men, uh, Hitilova is very much on sort of recognizing that we live in this kind of dual world where, you know, women need men and vice versa. So there is no escape, as in Telma and Louise, where the escape is into friendship between women. So there is no really friendship here as an alternative to being in this um, world. So all men seems to be the same. So the question is whether to change one unworthy partner for another remain single. The latter, however, is not an option for young women who want to have a child. So the tragedy of women in Hitilova's films is to do with biology. Women need men to reproduce, and they do want to reproduce. And I think what is interesting is that although women are presented in a better light, Hitilova is also here critical of them, and this kind of maybe um, generally uh, reveals this sort of, you know, this period when she became very negative, and this earlier films is also a good example of that. So for example, she allows her male characters to introduce women in a derogative manner. For example, a wife of a rich capitalist who is a drunkard. And you know, we otherwise might say that, you know, we would expect that this uh, uh, introduction doesn't stick, but actually it is, it seems like, you know, men knew about women. And she sort of confirms this description, showing her being drunken and making a spectacle of herself. So this wouldn't be like Telma and Louise, where female characters are presented with much sympathy. I would say even the main character comes across as sort of, you know, mad, which is how men see her in the film. Now, if you look closer now, how uh, Hitilova presents capitalism in the film, <coughs> This uh, is a sort of crony capitalism. 
uh, in which businessmen and politicians come together to privatize, maybe you can say it's um, rape, state assets for their own advantage rather than for good of the whole country. So in th we see that permissions to buy roads are given to businessmen prepared to line pockets of politicians. So it's a focus on corruption. The requirement to please business results also in a servile behavior on the part of politicians and the media, which the director mocks. And I would say this is the opposite of rude behavior characteristic of state employees during state socialism. Um, so I think many of these kind of, you know, directors almost look with um, with uh, nostalgia at the, time, at the time when, you know, employees had power rather than um, uh, those who had money had all power. Now, if we move to style, the story is told in a style which brings to mind many of Hitilova's earlier films. So it almost feels like a, you know, catalog of motives which we find earlier. Uh, so it's fast paced and at the beginning seemingly chaotic with several storylines running in parallel and many characters whose connections with each other are difficult to establish. This is how Itilova also um, made her earlier films. She liked parallel stories, um, uh, you know, in daisies, in uh, something different and so on. Camera work adds to this confusion. It's very mobile and omnipresent, like a nosy reporter who does not want to miss, miss any juicy detail. There is also the penchant for metaphors and self-reflexivity, on some occasions maybe too easy to decipher. In particular, episodes with pigs play on the idea that all men are pigs who need to be castrated and indeed all men in traps, traps would deserve their description, you know, very sort of carnal features, uh, creatures who really, you know, like fucking and eating. And I would say here perhaps it's sort of where she failed, at least, you know, for the, for the current maybe viewer. Uh, so the sort of, you know... Uh, <coughs> Uh, kind of equating men with pigs, in my opinion, doesn't work well, at least not for somebody like me, because pigs are harmless and intelligent animals, and in the film they're grossly mistreated, as are other farmed animals. The fact that Lenka participate in this mistreatment of, of animals somehow undermines her plight as a victim, as a harmed woman, as she come across as a victimizer, also in relation to... Um, to um, animals. I don't think anybody even tried to make an ecological re reading of, of this film or Czech uh, cinema at large. But you know, if you compare Czech cinema with Polish cinema, there will be always uh, much more emphasis on, um, on killing animals in Czech, Czech uh, films, sort of ritualistic, particularly, you know, killing of pigs. So I think <laughs> Hitilova is in this para paradigm. Menzel, for example, showed it many times in his films. Um, the film which brings, uh, uh, comes to mind more clear, obviously, is Daisies. Um, in both films, characters are reduced to chasing carnal pleasures, food and sex. There is no place for romantic love. Maybe there is no place for romantic love in any films made by... Um, Tilova. Um, there's always sort of, you know, um, male and female relations are kind of uh, defined by biology. Um, the mobile ca camera is another connection suggesting a lack of balance. Uh, in which, which in this occasion can be seen as a met metaphor of the first decade of capitalism in Czechia. There are also like visual connections. For example, we see the images of dolls in the sex shop. Um, this, this again is connection with daisies where the protagonists behave like mechanical dolls, maybe to lull men into passivity and cheat them. Another direct reference to daisies are images of war with bombs blasting, uh, which is watched by one character. 
Another film which, uh, in my opinion, uh, bring comes to my mind when watching it is the Apple Game. Uh, one of, in my view, best films in Hitlerova's career. Um, this is the story of a gynecologist with two lovers, including an, a young nurse. Uh, and one of the characters in um, <clears throat> Traps is also a doctor who has sex with the nurse during his working hours. This obviously is a cliche that, you know, doctors have this sort of sex with nurses in between seeing patients, but somehow uh, um, Hitilova uses it and I think uses it in, in, not in a critic, critical manner, sort of suggests that this is really what happens. That's I already mentioned in both films, there is a focus on biology, on reproductive functions, although in traps, this is mostly male reproductive organs, Why in the Apple game the focus was on female biology. Uh, there is also disillusionment about romantic love in both films and little of such love in her early productions. In terms of acting, some characters' acting is exaggerated and uh, unrealistic, but this refers primarily to men. How you will interpret it, I don't know. In my opinion, the, the, uh, the, I think Hitilova probably regarded this acting as realistic. She just wanted to, to, to see, or, you know, look how these men are, how ridiculous are these men. On the other hand, the actress cast as Lenka, Zuzana Stivinova, for whom it was one of the first films, acts realistically throughout the entire film. In my opinion, this sort of causes some kind of, you know, tension. I would say she is a weak link. We can say that she was less uh, kind of experienced than, than her male partners who were stars. Uh, also, uh, interesting things is hit that she uses classical music or music stylized in classical music. I actually wasn't able to identify what exactly it was. Uh, and also makes reference to it in the motif of uh, uh, Bach balls. And this can be seen as her drawing attention to the debasement of culture under post-communism. Classical music became decontextualized and merely serves consumerists, not like Mozart Kugel in Austria, or is an accompaniment to rape in the style of a clock, lo clockwork orange. You could see here these <coughs> um, Bach balls, which are like, you know, Czech equivalent of Mozart Kugel. Uh, and finally, worth mentioning um, other uh, authors. Uh, I, I already mentioned uh, Zuzana Stivinova, who plays the main part. For her, Traps was the first major role. Later, she became a prolific actress, playing largely in television. Uh, then we have two male actors who were uh, major stars at the time. So one is Thomas Hanak perhaps one of two greatest stars of this decade. He was also co-author of the script. Um, um, I would say he somehow enjoys playing a castrated man, maybe to somehow, you know, play with his image at the time as such a, you know, handsome man. He always played this kind of, you know, romantic lead in films or man with a lot of power. So maybe he enjoyed here playing the dis disempowered man. Mm. Milosław Donutil, Donald, another popular actor with a variety of roles. And maybe also worth mention mentioning that um, cinematography was um, done by uh, Hitilova's son, uh, Stepan Kuchera, who was, uh, who was one of two children we, we, she had with a, a cinematographer uh, you know, who made a lot of films during the Czech New Wave. Um, so in conclusion, I don't know, maybe you agree with me or maybe not. I would say not the most accomplished work in Hitilova's career, but one which sheds light on her thematic interest and style, like a mini archive of her films. So I think this is really a very interesting film for somebody who, you know, followed her career. 
And also, perversely, it's a film showing well how communism was conducive to creating new wave style by showing, you know, you cannot make such films after uh, 1990. So thank you very much. I hope uh, I didn't overuse my time. Huh? Um, okay, so thank you. That's all. All right. Uh... Well, please welcome uh, Eva back to the front. Yes. <laughs> and uh, as always, Bjorn will have the uh, roving mic for questions from the audience, but maybe I'll just start things off with a question of my own. Um, you said in your lecture, um, as opposed to the films that uh, Hitilova made in uh, pre-1989, uh, her films after that moment uh, are less, let's say, allegorical. Um, Partly because you know the kind of political restrictions she was working under were, were less um, blatant, but I couldn't help but think of allegorical possibilities for this film. Yeah, I was yeah. wondering. Yeah, obviously yeah. there are, but uh, they are kind of you know rather obvious. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I would say uh, and very kind of you know rooted in reality. It's not like you know this is. This is, I think, in intention, a realistic film. Mm -hmm. At least I interpret it this way. Of, of course, you know, the, 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 the eggs, the balls, and so on, all these things can be, you know, read metaphorically. Yeah, yeah, I've no, no, no yeah. doubt about it. That even the, even the moon, we can say it's, it can be a reference to um, uh, Le Chien and the Lou, when, the and the, you yeah, know, when yeah. it's cut. So many of these yeah. things we can find, you know, like, like, like references, but it's not like in daisies when this reality is kind of self-contained. Here it's, it's, I would say, realistic, you know, or, or, or meant to be realistic representation and the metaphors has just happened. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Do, can we read Lenka as being standing in for the Czech people? Uh, in uh, this new uh, s in this new political situation of the nineteen oh, nineties, I, I didn't think about it, but you know, it might be you know interpreted this way as somebody who is sort of you know wronged and uh, you know raped and then wronged, and there is no justice for yeah. for people like her. Yeah, I mean, but I said the, the the issue around her being involved with animals somehow weakens her position as a victim, at least, you know, for, for, for me. I know that, again, it's, it's, uh, it, it, it plays a realistic role. It plays a role in the film that she's a vet. But, you know, seeing all these sort of graphic scenes, I would say, shows the, you know, woman who is also kind of, you know, brutal towards, you know, males. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I thought it was striking that um, in Hitilova's films from... Uh, pre-1989 we see a lot of women uh, womanizers uh, mm -hmm. a lot of men who are kind of uh, yes treating women uh, with a less than a total respect uh, but to kind of go to the direction of uh, well, to kind of break the hurdle of let's say uh, actual rape uh, mm -hmm. as depicted in this film seems to also denote something about what's changed in in Czech mm -hmm. society, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. the sort of pr maybe brutalization of mm -hmm. the of the society, what was only um, suggested before, you can just see here, mm -hmm. and I would say uh, here somehow Hitilova doesn't really suggest anything. This is all showing a bit maybe like you know Hitchcock in Frenzy. Mm -hmm. You know H Hitchcock is re was sort of regarded as the sort of master of you know, concealment claimed that in Frenzy, which was one of his last films, he sort of, you know, showed everything. So yeah, a, bit, yeah. a bit like her here. It's funny, I just actually, t in my own class, uh, just taught Marnie, which also has okay. this kind of uh, very uh, signal rape scene uh, mm -hmm. in the middle of it. Um, the, the scandalous thing about that scene, though, uh, in a way, is that it's played like slapstick. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which is kind of hard for an audience to t or hard for me at least in the audience to take mm -hmm. you're watching a rape scene but also it's played for laughs to a certain degree it's that i mean it's a very inept rape mm -hmm. the ca the men reveal themselves to be pathetic at the same time as they're mm -hmm. um uh, uh you know violating this woman uh i mean how we 
how are we supposed to juggle that uh, as spectators? Well, I, I would again say that, you know, uh, this sort of slapstick for me doesn't really undermine, you know, realism. The film can still be watched in a realistic mode. But maybe, you know, maybe you disagree. I don't, I don't know. It's certainly not like, again, not like in, you know, daisies when you know that it's kind of, um, th the characters are really not, you know, three-dimensional, that they are, you know, cartoons where here we can say, oh, men like that really exist. Um, so, and... <laughs> yeah. uh, questions or comments from the audience? Yeah, thanks very much for your lecture. I liked it very much. Um, but I would go on a bit further. I mean, because you were sort of criticizing her, and for me, she, I mean, uh, after having watched the film now, I would say, um, isn't there two good mes messages about this film? I mean, first of all, I mean, she feels for me like a Nietzsche, Schopenhauer kind of guy saying, without art, without culture, life is unbearable. This is why I'm making this movie, because I'm showing you all these unbearable things, you know, child rape, rape, um, all kinds of cruelties people do against each other, all kinds of violence that's going on. Mm -hmm. So in a way, this is also a position to say, not just, and you mentioned that in your lecture, not just state social socialism is bad, mm -hmm. and, and capitalism mm -hmm. of course is bad, but basically saying, okay, this is the only solution I have. Mm -hmm. Now, at the end, of course, the good person, Lenka, who is, from my, from my point of view, just Hitilova herself, mm -hmm. is then put into an asylum, of course, mm -hmm. because as an artist, your position has to be <coughs> that you're not so serious, you know, uh, that you're in a way playing the fool, the, the joker, telling the truth mm -hmm. to the society in a way you, you know you're assaulting society, mm -hmm. but uh, uh, in a way you, you have to pretend that you're the fool, okay? And so I think this is sort of how I saw the ending of the, of the film. Mm -hmm. And, uh, okay, maybe let's just stop here for a moment, because I, w I would say uh, this is a solution she has. It's not just disillusionment, okay? It's the typical 19th century solution of saying art can save us, I mean, which is not so modern. You know, mm -hmm. this is a pre-modern notion of art. Uh, in modernity, of course, you have art being very closely connected with life. That's a completely different Mm -hmm. approach even especially if you look at eastern mm -hmm. uh, uh kind of art if you look at people like Malev malievich and so on mm -hmm. or socialist realism even there's a close connection mm -hmm. with life she doesn't believe into that for her art is different and the second point is just briefly is of course there's a, another castration going on not just of the men uh but also of the trees in on the road and it's supposed to be a conservation place, blah, blah, blah. And uh, funnily enough, the, the minister uh, for the environment says very much in the beginning, ah, the great outdoors and what you see is the trash, the litter mm -hmm. all around. Um, I like that because for him, it's of course the typical criticism about rulers or the state is they don't care, it's, it's a racket that's how you make money, it's the mafia. Mm -hmm. It's the same kind of mafia in capitalism and in state socialism. Nothing has changed. So again, the only option you have is to, to survive in this kind of environment is art. And this is why if you look at her city feature, feature about Prague, I, I've forgotten the title, um, you can see how much she loves culture in a way and how much, and you mentioned that in terms of the music, how much uh, she she admires really uh, culture, and that's the only solution because usually she she doesn't say anything positive about art uh, about nature, and the only thing that's mentioned here is if nature is changed into an art, a conservation place like a garden. Okay, that's again a pre-modern notion I think of of art and and nature. Uh, well, I I don't know. I mean, it's very interesting. Um kind of reading of the film, but in my opinion, actually, uh, art is not he edified here. I would say even this sort of, you know, this, this classical music, I would say it's presented in such a way that it's kind of, you know, 
um, th doesn't really show its beauty. And you know, the context is such that, you know, like for example, the woman who is singing at the, at the party, yeah? It's, 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 it's presented in such a way that the you know, music is fragmented, that it's used in a very kind of, I would say, you know, utilitarian way. And I think this is her sort of you know, criticism that everything is kind of used you know, pragmatically, that in this world, and I think in this sense, you know, I think she, she is actually more pro-socialism pro than capitalism because you know in socialism there was and and as I said off screen she somehow defended you know socialism because she said that there was this sort of area of of, of you know of 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 sacrum in uh, under socialism where here you know there is nothing there you know Bach and so on Bach Bach is just used to sell you know chocolate candy not to um, you know enjoy as a kind of you know autonomous you know, work. Um, so I would say, you know, she doesn't really show it in the film. Maybe, you know, the film itself shows it after, you know, we watch it. But so I would say without the, without the world of film, this, this is not, uh, you know, clear for me. But I agree with you that generally the, the, the image is here very grim. It's, it's, it's a very kind of, despite the humor and so on, it's, it's, it's a very dark film, maybe the darkest film she ever made. And I would think also in terms, you ask if whether Le Lenka stands for um, Czech people. In my opinion, Lenka stands more for herself, yes? And you know, the people I, I, I was in contact with who actually met uh, Hitilova near the end of, her life, they claimed that she was very difficult to talk. She sort of she, she, she was, you know, prone to, you know, attacking people and so on. So she was kind of, you know, a bit mad or gave impression of being a bit mad. A bit or a bitterness. Yes, she yeah. was very bitter. Yes, she was very bitter about, you know, industry, about, you know, everything, about her career. Um, and also, as you perhaps know, she became sort of also nostalgic in this last period. So actually, the, the period of sta state socialism became kind of, you know, um, edified. She, she became kind of, you know, had this, you know, what's called, you know, um, nostalgia, yes? Yeah? Su suffered from sort of nostalgia, or at least, you know, was quite sympathetic to this, you know, period. So. Maybe just some first impressions from, because I've, I've never seen the film, is that I share some of your concerns about the film or your criticisms. But on the other hand, I also like, really felt, I really th uh, think that uh, the film being so blunt and simple is really also a strong, strong feature of it, because it somehow still works, this bluntness, and mm -hmm. it's really attacking things which... Um, I, I think you could criticize and mm -hmm. so I'm not sure whether it's uh, like a complete failure but mm -hmm. it, it is also not like a super successful film in what it tries to achieve but I think this bluntness and um, mm -hmm. harshness also with the ending which is like really sinister um, the yeah, like yeah, the yeah. Last, last sequence so I think um, this this bluntness is in some way also productive in, in a sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I agree with you. And also we can say that from this perspective also the film is very kind of consistent, you know, everything is bland, you know, like the, the colors are very, you know, harsh. The, uh, you know, the dialogue is very, you know, harsh. The characters are very kind of black and white. So, um, so I think she probably just wanted to make such a film, you know, just say, oh, you know, I hate everybody. <laughs> uh, no kind of, no way to, to hide it or no means to hide it. It's just, you know, how I see the world. Yeah. Just to, to add a bit further, uh, if you make a short story out of the Frankfurt School, Horkheim Adorno kind of people, mm -hmm. You would say art makes life livable. Mm -hmm. You know that's the Nietzschean touch in mm -hmm. the Frankfurt School. So, what she shows us in the film here is, okay, look, socialism maybe didn't work, especially state socialism. Even mm -hmm. communism maybe does not work. 
simply for the reason we are such bad people. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> There's evil in us, so to speak, or drives or whatever you want to call that, the whole Freudian mm -hmm, mm -hmm. stuff. And of course, that's disappointing because you see hardly any kind of progress. But that's the kind of solution a lot of people in 68 were at least criticizing here in Germany about people like Adorno. They were saying, look, I mean, you escape towards art instead of becoming political. Mm -hmm. Because even sexuality, of course, is political. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we see that in the film, too. How it's used all the time to bribe somebody and, and so on. I think this is, uh, mm -hmm. this is the kind of... Uh, pessimism about it and she's lost of course this optimism and becomes bitter and so on yeah 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 yeah. i agree with you but this somehow confirms my um point which i made earlier that you know she somehow um notices this limitation of art so from this perspective if we compare it with daisies daisies, daisies are very much about you know you can create this very stylized world this uh, and you know something will change and then you know Fast forward to 1998, nothing changed, or things changed for, for the worse. So, you know, just just show it in all these harsh colors. And uh, as you noticed, this has a, this has a value. Uh, and ju just sort of, I watched this film now maybe for the fourth or fifth time, the first time on the, uh, you know, white screen. And I would say on a white screen, it's actually gains. I think this is a film which somehow, you know, is suitable for, for widescreen because you could see more the, especially the colors. I haven't noticed when I watched it last time, the sort of the play with colors, the, the primary colors. So I think this is, th this, you know, needs the um, widescreen and maybe in terms of playing with colors after, um, what's the title, Tree, Tree of Paradise or? Fruit of Paradise. Fruit of Paradise. Yeah, which, Fruit which of we Paradise. saw last week. Maybe, you know, this, this is the most accomplished film in terms of, you know, how she uses color in the film. Yeah, I mean, there though, I mean, there was a real artistic, in Fruit of Paradise, a, a real kind of artistic use of color, <laughs> let's say. Yes. Um, and experimentation with, yes, the, yes. you know, what, the, what film can produce visually. Uh, and here there just seems to be this, and I mean, granted the, the copy wasn't, great but i think that, that mm -hmm. was still somehow faithful <laughs> to the original there's a kind of sickliness in the image right mm -hmm, the, mm -hmm, the, mm -hmm. the colors are precisely this kind of morbid colors yes 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 oh. yes 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 okay. which is yeah i mean symptomatic even on the, on the level of the visuals of the film for yeah. how she like how she's viewing uh the world at this moment yeah, um, yeah i did want to ask i mean uh, just raise it a little bit is if art you know, and politics are both kind of evacuated of, of any hope. Uh, is the eco like the ecological question still something she can hold on to? Is there? Yeah, but I would say here she somehow fails, or I don't know what she wants to say because, as I said, on one hand, there is this issue of you know cutting trees and and so on. But I would ring road construction. Yes, I wouldn't make too much of it. I think this is a part of the of the criticism of the failure of capitalism, and I think you know. For, for me, you know, there's also this issue of abuse of animals. And I would say this somehow undermines, um, you know, Lenka's plight. Because, you know, we also get these kind of, you know, these pigs mis mistreated and, 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 and so on. So I would say, you know, um, look at animals too. So somehow, you know, the... the but is the film, I mean... The film is. Uh, what is the perspective of the film on that? It's not. It's not. I mean, it, there's a kind of critique of this kind of industrialization. No, 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 no. This is my point. There is no critique of there's that. There's no critique. You know, okay. nobody asks Lenka. You know, is it okay to sort of you know treat pigs this way, or you know, is it okay to somehow you know um, make the uh, you know. Uh, the cow being kind of raped by a bull or something like that. So yeah. this is this is all somehow not tackled. Yeah, I mean the other the other. And, uh, uh, sorry, yeah. and and maybe at, as I said, maybe in 1998, this film also was somehow viewed differently than it's viewed now from from this perspective. Because you know, in the uh, how many years, 25 years almost or so, there was a lot of kind of you know 
discussions about treatment of um, farmed animals. Um, so I, I, I believe, you know, um, views on that have changed. So, you know, maybe people who watched it in 1988 just thought, oh, so what? You know, this is how we produce, you know, beef, for example. Yes, yeah? so this is how we produce pork. Um, but uh, I would say today it's uh, the view ch changed. And I think, in my opinion, she wasn't really aware of that. You know, she came from this generation who, uh, you know, slaughtered pigs for, uh, because it was Czech tradition. Uh, very, just want to like insert a slight question or remark. Uh, the other thing I noted uh, in the film is this ironic moment where Michelle is actually much more focused on like defeating Donal on the political matter than on yes. the matter that he raped his wife yes. <laughs> or he raped his girlfriend, um, which to me also had a kind of uh, at least a, a kind of ironic. Uh, take on let's say the environmentalist movement or people yes, who kind yes, of focus on these questions <laughs> you, you know fake, it, fake in environmentalism yeah yeah, yeah. Yes. fake leftist you know yes. bourgeois leftist uh, so yes, bourgeois yes, and so on yes. uh, but in terms of the animals I'm, I'm not sure if i really agree with you because the only thing that's really done violently to these animals they are not in a slaughterhouse, remember that. There are many movies showing animals being brought or, or pigs and, and cows and so on being brought to slaughterhouses, how they're killed there. This is industrialized killing. In this case, it's not the killing, it's just making or castrating the pigs. That's all that's happening in terms of violence. Now, what is that? Castration is not just, you know, about impotence, like for men or blah, 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 but it's also to end the reproduction. I mean, if you think about socialism, you know how, how, how important the term of reproduction is. And she says, okay, we can't go on reproducing like that. And this whole topic of reproduction is continuous. I mean, with, with the little girl, with the girlfriend who wants to become pregnant, all this kind of stuff. And uh, with men, some of them want to have children, others not, blah, blah, blah. Uh, all this kind of stuff. I mean, uh, she says, we can go on reproducing like that. And at that time, there were like philosophers and so on who said seriously, okay, we have enough of that. I mean, we have too many people on this planet. We have to really cut down, so to speak. And uh, so I, I saw it like that. And, and I didn't see it so much in terms of animal violence because actually she is a veterinarian helping the animals, right? She's not trying to kill them, but to try to heal them. So actually she, she's doing something for the animals so that they don't reproduce so much anymore, so that they don't have to be brought, for example, to a slaughterhouse. That's a difference. If you have a thousand pigs, you have to bring them to a slaughterhouse. If you have, they let's say, 100, you don't. Uh, so, well, they will end up in the slaughterhouse, but I think the way the animals are actually are treated is, is, is for me cruel. You know, if you looked at the sort of small pig, it's sort of kept like that, hanging in the, in the air. It's, it's for me obvious that this pig is, um, you know, suffering. Um, so anyway, this is how I, <laughs> how I see. I, I, I kind of respect your view, and there is also, you know, validity. The the, the issue of reproduction is, um, is is there. But I think in many of, of of I would say, you know, she always looks at the sort of male female relations very much from the perspective of biology. She's not somebody who somehow, you know is interested or believes in romantic love in her <laughs> films, rather the opposite is, is, is the case, you know. Romanticism in these films is somehow a smoke screen behind, which is the issue of sort of, you know, yes, reproducing, yes? But that's, uh, maybe, uh, because you're talking about also like, what, thinking about the film 25 years later from our position, uh, there is also this sense in her that, uh, and and I think you mentioned this in the lecture, like the kind of distance she took from the feminist movement that, you know, she believes in this kind of permanence of the biological drive. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And that that is like, no matter how much feminist consciousness you might have or mm -hmm. political like uh, transformation you might uh, desire, those biological urges are going to remain. Mm -hmm. so, yes, and they're going to be remain decisive as long as there are human beings on the Yes, I, I, I think it's very very much her work and I think from this perspective it's very interesting that you know a filmmaker who is sort of you know 
uh, celebrated as a feminist, uh, pay so much attention to, to the site. I think, uh, in my view, and rightly so, yeah, this is, this is you know, what, what, what drives us and, you know, you cannot really, you know, eliminate it. And this, this is this sort of conundrum that men can be pigs, you know, maybe most, 99% of men are sort of pigs, still women will gravitate to them because women have the same sexual, you know, urge as men. And indeed, in this film, you know, maybe women have even greater sexual urge than than men because we we have at least you know three women who are very kind of f forcefully, you know, put put themselves to to to, to males, you know, to, to, to men's interest. Shall we? Finish. Call it a night. Uh, Eva has a very early flight uh, the next morning. Yes. So maybe, Thank you very uh, much for <laughs> staying so long. <laughs> it's, it's, it's very um, In this intimate setting uh, to close things off. Well, thank you once again to Eva. Um, and thank you to again. the audience, what's left of the audience. Okay, thank thing. you very much uh, for coming. And again, for, you know, Daniel for inviting me and organizing this. And uh, we'll be back next year uh, in October with our next series, uh, Theme to be decided <laughs> uh, but we will watch this space so we will uh, announce things on that score soon uh, okay thank so you yeah. very much thank you thank you